Hey guys, it's Bella. Welcome back to my channel. I hope you guys are all having a wonderful day and an incredible holiday season. Before we get into today's case, I just quickly want to thank today's sponsor, NordVPN, for making today's video possible. So if you guys don't know what a VPN is, it basically encrypts your IP address and hides your IP address so that you are able to use the internet and Wi-Fi privately and safely. It encrypts your online traffic so that people can't spy on you and track what you're doing and watch what you're doing online, you know, like government agencies, marketers, internet service providers, they all want to track and collect your private online data, but a VPN prevents them from being able to do that. It also allows you to use public Wi-Fi safely, and it also allows you to access content that may not be available in your country. I mean, that's the whole reason I actually got a VPN in the first place. I've been using NordVPN for years now, and that's exactly why I got onto them. <laughs> so if I want to watch a movie and it's only been released in the US or the UK or I'm watching a series and the new episodes haven't been released here in Australia, I just go on my VPN and I change my location to the US or UK or wherever that show is coming from so that I can watch it at the same time as everyone else and be in on the loop. Or sometimes when I travel, I actually use it to put me back in Australia so that I can watch shows that I've been watching here in Australia. I mean, not for a while, thanks to COVID. I haven't had to do that, but you know, soon, wishfully thinking. <laughs> also, it is so easy to use. Seriously, all you have to do is open the map, click on the location you want your VPN to be in, and that's it. You'll be connected in seconds. So if you guys are interested in checking out NordVPN, which I would highly, highly recommend, they actually have a holiday season deal on at the moment. So if you go to nordvpn.com slash bellafiori, you can get a two-year plan plus an additional one month for a huge discount. So I'll leave all of the information in the description down below. So make sure you guys check that out and let's go ahead and get into today's video. So in today's video, we are going to be talking about the disappearance of two-year-old Nicole Bettison. And there's not a ton of information about the disappearance. Not a lot is really known about the whole situation, but I'll tell you what information there is and then I'll get into some theories about what may have happened at the end. There also aren't a lot of photos in the case. I know you guys like when there are photos on the screen for a majority of the video, but I couldn't find photos of even half the people in this case. So on Labor Day in 1977, which was the 5th of September, Susan Klingle and Jarrett Bettison were driving in or near Dearborn, Michigan with their daughter, Nicole Bettison, in the car. And they got into a pretty terrible crash. Like it was not good. They must have rolled maybe three or four times. And fortunately, Jarrett and Nicole were both okay, but Susan hadn't been wearing a seatbelt. So her body was thrown out of the car and she was actually found a few meters away from the crash site and she was pronounced dead on scene and obviously with such a terrible crash the police searched through the car trying to figure out what went wrong and what may have caused the crash and they found a stash of marijuana so they wanted to charge Jarrett with vehicular homicide for driving under the influence and I don't know what happened or if there wasn't enough evidence but they actually were never able to charge him for that so after the accident obviously Susan, Nicole's mother, was not alive anymore and Jarrett and Susan actually weren't married and Susan and Nicole actually weren't living with Jarrett so a decision had to be made about what was going to happen with Nicole. I mean I'm assuming he wasn't the best dad because you know I feel like normally it'd be pretty straightforward the dad would just kind of keep on keeping on with the kid but there was definitely some family drama. Susan's parents did not like Jarrett at all. Jarrett claimed it was because Susan's parents were racist but Susan's parents claimed that they didn't like him because he got Susan into drugs. But either way, Nicole went to live with her maternal grandparents, so Susan's parents, and she was there for several months and they loved having her. They were so happy to have her. They loved her. They cared for her. They really cherished her because she was their only grandchild. And then one day after a few months, Jarrett shows up at their front door with a new woman and he's like, hey, I've got this new girlfriend named Barbara Sadler and we're ready to settle down and have a family, start a family, which sidestep here, but your ex just died a few months ago and you're showing up at her parents' house with your new girlfriend saying you want your kid back and that you're ready to settle down and have a family with this woman a few months after your ex died. I mean, I guess people have different ways of coping, but if Kerry moved on and started a family like a few months after I died, 
I would haunt the shit out of him. I'm just kidding. I would want him to be happy. I would definitely haunt him. 100%. Anyway, so he shows up out of the blue one day and he's like, I want custody of Nicole back so me and Nicole and Barbara can go and start a family together out west. And I believe Barbara was there as well because apparently Barbara said to the Klingles, like, I plan on being the best mother I could possibly be to Nicole and blah blah blah. And the Klingles were, you know, they definitely were very reluctant. They had their reservations about the whole situation because first of all, he had left Nicole with them and buggered off for a few months. And second of all, the whole situation must have been really odd for them to have their daughter's ex-boyfriend show up with a new woman he planned on starting a family with. So obviously, you know, they had their reservations about the whole thing, but he was her father. There wasn't much that they could do about it. You know, he had a right to raise her. So after a very tearful goodbye, Nicole, Jarrett and Barbara hit the road and the Klingles had no idea when they would ever get to see their granddaughter again. Jarrett and Barbara told some people they were going to California. They told other people they were going to Las Vegas. And honestly, nobody knows where they ended up. They could have gone to California. They could have gone to Las Vegas, they could have gone to the middle of bumfuck nowhere and nobody would have known any better because nobody heard from them for the next 20 years. They just said see you later and dipped for 20 years. Obviously the Klingles never heard from any of them during this time either and they were super worried about Nicole but they just tried to keep the faith, they tried to keep an open mind and stay hopeful that Jarrett and Barbara were treating Nicole well and they decided that eventually they would look for her when she was an adult and when she was old enough that she could make her own decision about whether or not she wanted to have a relationship with them. So they waited until the 1990s. Obviously by this point Nicole was a lot older and they were also getting older themselves and they just wanted to find their only granddaughter. So they hired a private investigator named Peggy Bezzy and Peggy tried tried for a hot minute to try and find any trace of Nicole whatsoever and she just couldn't. She had no luck. And then one day she managed to find Jarrett and Barbara and they were living in Las Vegas, but it was just the two of them. There was no sign of Nicole at all. She looked through all of the school registration records in the area and she found no Nicole. And in fact, she actually didn't find any child that could be connected to the Bettisons. And then she actually found out that Nicole was actually eligible for social security checks because her mother had passed away when she was young. And Jarrett and Barbara had collected these checks every single month up until Nicole's 18th birthday, despite the fact that there was no signs of Nicole having lived with them pretty much ever. And obviously the whole situation is looking super sketchy. And so Peggy decides to reach out to local law enforcement to tell them about her suspicions. And she gets put in contact with Detective Jeff Rosgen. And she tells him that she's found all this weird stuff and that she's really sus on Jarrett and Barbara. And she thinks that they have murdered Jarrett's daughter. Nicole. And at first he was kind of hesitant to look into the case because they had a really huge amount of missing persons cases at the time and he was just absolutely swamped with work. But as he looked into the case a little bit, he was really intrigued by it and he really wanted to know what happened to Nicole. So he decides to go ahead and look into it and he looks into family court records, he looks into driver's license records, he looks into police records, records, basically all of the stuff Peggy didn't have access to. And he finds no trace of Nicole. He finds no trace of any child ever having lived with Jarrett and Barbara Bettison. There was no trace of Nicole whatsoever after leaving Michigan. So basically after Jarrett and Barbara picked her up in 1978, it's like she just vanished. So Detective Rosgin was trying to figure out his game plan because there was literally no evidence. Like there was no evidence whatsoever in this case. It's like she just vanished and that's a bit sus, but there's no evidence of anything happening. There's no evidence of her even being with them ever. So really the only chance he has to find out what happened to Nicole is to go ahead and talk to Jarrett and Barbara, but he obviously has to be really careful in how he goes about it because there's no evidence. So he decided that he was gonna go and talk to Jarrett and he was gonna pretend that he knew what had happened to Nicole already, thinking if Jarrett thought that he knew everything, he'd be more inclined to just be like, okay, yeah, you're right. 
right, this is what happened. But that is not at all how things went down. So Detective Rosgang goes to Brenda and Jarrett's house, which is in a pretty like run down, not great part of Las Vegas. And the house itself is like pretty much just a big mess. It's dilapidated, it's dirty, it is just not good. And he knocks on the front door and Jarrett answers. He comes to the front door in a motorized wheelchair, which he explains is from a bus crash he was in a few years earlier. So Detective Rosgen gets right into it. He immediately confronts Jarrett and he tells him that he knows everything that happened to Nicole. He knows the whole truth and that they would go lighter on him and give him a lighter sentence if he would just tell the truth and confess. He told Jarrett that if he didn't tell the truth, if he didn't confess that he would be brought in front of a grand jury where he would be forced to tell the truth and Jarrett you know he was spooked he was freaking out but he tells detective Rosgin that he is willing to cooperate and that he'll call him in a few days so four days later detective Rosgin gets a call and it's from Jarrett and he basically tells him he just he needs a little more time because he needs to get in contact with Nicole and he needs to you know prepare things ten days later Rosgin gets another call from Jarrett and and Jarrett once again says that he needs more time and there is nothing Rosgen can do because he is just bluffing this whole thing. It's not like he can go and arrest him or take him in for questioning or anything like that because he has nothing. So he waits and he doesn't hear back from them. So he tries to get in contact with them and he calls the Bettison's home phone, but they don't answer and he never hears from them again. And then he goes on Christmas break and when he gets back, he sees a stack of memos on his desk from the Las Vegas homicide squad. So he immediately calls them up and they tell him that on the 22nd of December in 1997 that a couple had been found dead in their apartment by the building manager and that couple was 49 year old Jarrett Bettison and 50 year old Barbara Sadler or I guess you know now Barbara Bettison. Barbara's body was found in the master bedroom. She was found on the waterbed in there and she had been shot twice either in the head or the heart with a 22 caliber rifle and she was found with a cross in one hand and a Bible in the other. The bed had been straightened underneath her and a single red rose had been placed on her chest. Jarrett was found in the next bedroom and he was found with a blanket covering him and a single self-inflicted gunshot wound to the head. So he had obviously killed Barbara and then killed himself in a murder-suicide. It was determined that they had actually been in there decomposing for three weeks before the building manager found them, which is insane to me because there was like bills and eviction notices and all of that sort of thing taped to the front door. So people had gone up there, taped things to their front door and hadn't like smelt anything funky or, you know, reported anything. Like they were decomposing for three weeks. It would have smelt foul. It would have smelt so funky in there and no one smelt anything. Or maybe they did smell something. They were just like, nah, that's above my pay grade or that is none of my business. <laughs> so police searched the house for any indication as to why they may have ended their lives and also for any signs of Nicole and what happened to little Nicole. In the bathroom they found a bottle of Barbara's prescription pills and in the lounge room they found Jarrett's motorized wheelchair and it was clear that they had been suffering with poor health for quite a while. No, nothing to indicate that Nicole had ever lived with him and Barbara. The only thing that they found in that apartment which showed any signs signs of Jarrett's life before Barbara was a single folder which contained Susan's death certificate, a photo of Jarrett and Susan from their apartment in 1977, and a report on the car crash. And that's it. There were no photos of Nicole in that photo and there was nothing in the folder or in the apartment to indicate that Nicole had ever lived with Jarrett and Barbara. There was also no suicide note left in the apartment. The only thing that they found was a note that was stuck to the fridge which was addressed to the building manager which basically just said sorry forgive us for the mess you have to deal with. And before they actually went through with the murder-suicide Barbara had sent one final letter to her mother-in-law 
Joni Bettison, so Jarrett's mother, and she hadn't heard from or seen her son or Barbara in 20 years, just like everybody else. And she actually received this letter three weeks before their body was found. So I don't know if it like didn't have a return address on it or if she didn't report it or if she didn't think she needed to report it or what, but she obviously got this letter and didn't say anything that would alert the police to go and check their apartment. But let me read you a part of the letter. It said, we've tried to follow God. Now it's time for him to judge us. By the time you read this, we should be dead. Jared is about to go to jail and I don't want to live without him. I'm sorry about living apart from our family. I'm sorry about so many things. We've had a sad and difficult life. Go to your Bibles and seek peace. And please forgive us for all the wounds we have put in your hearts with our tragic and youthful blunders. And then also included in the letter was a money order for $900, which was like prepayment for their cremation. And Barbara had also requested that her and Jared's ashes go in the same urn. I mean, based on the letter and the fact that she said Jared is about to go to jail and she apologized for their youthful blunders, I feel like it's pretty much an admission, right? I mean, obviously not legally, but I feel like it's fair to deduce that they either murdered Nicole or did something to Nicole. And because it had been so long, the statute of limitations would apply to any crime at that point except for murder. So the only thing he could be sent to prison for would be for murder. So why would they be worried about him going to jail if they didn't kill Nicole? I mean, unless they did something to her more recently, but based on the fact that there is no trace of Nicole whatsoever after 1978, I just, you know, I fail to believe anything happened more recently than that. Also saying they had a sad, difficult life. Like, do you expect me to feel bad for you? Cause I don't. Cause if you murdered a two year old girl, then I mean, that's just karma. I also wondered if it was Barbara that actually wrote and sent that letter to Jarrett's parents, because why would she send a letter to Jarrett's parents? I mean, obviously they didn't have a particularly close relationship because she started dating her son and then said see you later and dipped for 20 years and never spoke to them again. So I just always wondered if it was maybe Jarrett who actually sent that letter. I mean, not that it matters or have, has any significance. I mean, maybe she would have sent that letter to Jarrett's mother because she helped murder her granddaughter. I mean, also the fact that in the letter it said that they were worried Jarrett would go to jail and she didn't want to live without Jarrett. Maybe she didn't even want to be part of the murder-suicide. Like, maybe it was all Jarrett and he just didn't want to seem like he also murdered Barbara. But as I'm sure you've guessed, it's theorized that they believed that they were going to go to jail and they thought death was a better option to jail and that is why they went ahead with the murder-suicide. They believed that Rosgin and the state had all of this information against them and all of this evidence against them when... In reality, Rosgin was bluffing and they had nothing. Kind of rhymed. Rosgin was bluffing and they had nothing. You have to wonder as well, like if they went in with a different approach and maybe went in a little bit slower that we may have found out what happened to Nicole. But unfortunately now it's pretty likely that this case will never be solved and we will never know the true story of what happened to Nicole. Obviously it's pretty widely believed that Nicole is dead and it's also pretty widely believed that she never made it past 1978. And the worst part is, like, if Jarrett didn't want Nicole, why did he take her? Why didn't he just leave her with her grandparents? They loved having her. They cared for her. They looked after her. They didn't want him to take her. There was just no reason for it. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about theories. The first theory is that Nicole misbehaved on the drive to Las Vegas. And so Jarrett and Barbara either killed her on purpose or killed her by accident and they basically freaked out, they panicked and they went and buried her body somewhere so that they wouldn't get in trouble for it. And based on the fact that in Barbara's letter, she apologized for hurting them, she 
said to go and seek peace in the Bible and she apologized for their youthful blunders, some people think that this indicates that it was an accident. Jarrett may have freaked out after everything happened with Susan's death and the car crash and he was just worried that after that no one would believe that it was an accident so he panicked and he covered the whole thing up so he didn't have to go to jail. Another theory is that they actually sold Nicole to a couple that was looking to adopt that maybe Barbara didn't want to be burdened with a small child so they decided to do like an under the radar adoption for some quick cash maybe. I mean maybe the whole reason that they even picked her up in the first place was so that they could sell her. Maybe they didn't have any intentions at all of ever looking after her. And on that note some people actually believe they may have sold her into sex trafficking or something similar for a quick buck so that they could go and buy some drugs or maybe they just sold her for drugs. But I don't know, the whole thing is so odd. I mean, personally, I feel like this theory is a little unlikely because I just feel like they would have mentioned something like that in their letter so that the Klingles could have gone out to try and find Nicole and find out who she was adopted out to or something like that. But in the letter, it really makes it seem like Nicole is dead and it's their fault. I mean, maybe they took her and killed her just so that she wouldn't be around, they wouldn't have to look after her, but they could keep cashing her social security checks up until her 18th birthday, which they did do. Like the fact that they continued to cash her checks is so sad. They know what happened to her. I'm sure of it based on the letter. They know what happened and they felt no remorse in going and cashing those checks every single month. Some people believe that Nicole's body actually maybe has been found and that her body just hasn't been identified as Nicole, that she may be one of those Jane Doe's out there who has never been identified. There actually have been people online who have gone and found cases of Jane Doe bodies that haven't been identified that are kind of a match to Nicole and, you know, they've speculated that that could potentially be her body. But unfortunately, I don't think we'll ever know because I don't think think at this point that there's ever any chance of her being identified. But that is everything that I have for this case. That's it from me today, guys. I, as always, would love to discuss your thoughts in the comments down below and what theory you believe. I mean, personally, based on the letter, I really think that they murdered Nicole. They continued to cash her social security checks. They didn't feel bad about it. They knew she was dead. They knew that nobody else could go and cash her social security checks. And the statute of limitations would prevent them from being charged for anything other than murder. As I said, unfortunately, we will never know the true story of what happened to Nicole. But that is it for me today, guys. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day and hopefully I will see you tomorrow for my next video. Bye, guys.